Welcome back to Zion's Redemption Radio Network. I'm your host, Mark Lichtenwalter. Today we're going to be talking or reading chapter 18 of the Teachings of the Doctrine of Eternal Lives. The title of this chapter is John or Elijah and John the Baptist. The Apostle Matthew. Jesus began to say unto the multitude concerning John, a prophet, Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before my face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not arisen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. Matthew chapter 11, verses 7, 9, uh, 7, 9 through 11, 13, and 14. The Concordant Version translates it as, And if you are willing to receive him, he is Elijah. That's the uh, literal New Testament version. Why then do, do our teachers say that Elijah must come first? He replied, Yes, Elijah will come and set everything right. But I tell you that Elijah has come already. And they failed to recognize him, and worked their will upon him. And in the same way, the Son of Man is to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he meant John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 17, 10 through 13 uh, of the English version uh, and the KJV. Um, I was just thinking, so... In the Doctrine and Covenants, it says that uh, Jesus Christ says um, in section 85 that he will send one mighty and strong to set the house of God in order, which implies that it will become out of order, which it has. But um, I think it's interesting that, that Jesus says that he will set, let's see, how, how does it go here? that he will set everything right. I think a lot of people don't understand that um, something I only understand uh, because God showed it to me, um, that John the Baptist was one who was mighty and strong. And for this earth, there are 15 which include the Father, the Son, and the uh, God, the Witness, or the Holy Ghost. They are considered mighty and strong for this earth, but also there are twelve others who are mighty and strong, four for each major dispensation, beginning with, well, four, but then you have to include the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, so five actually. So the first dispensation was the dispensation of the Morning Star who is our Father, both spiritually and physically, and the Father of Jesus Christ. And his name was Michael, and he became Adam, and he was mighty and strong, and he came as the morning sun. In that dispensation, Enoch was mighty and strong as well. Noah was mighty and strong as well. And Elijah was also considered mighty and strong. In the dispensation preceding, or uh, after the dispensation of the morning sun, is the dispensation of the bright and morning sun. 
And John the Baptist was an Elias to set things in order to prepare the way for Yeshua or Jesus Christ to come. And he was mighty and strong. Jesus, of course, is the bright and morning star, and he is also mighty and strong. And Peter, James, and John are also mighty and strong to carry on the work after Jesus departed from the scene. In this dispensation, the dispensation of the evening star, Joseph Smith was an Elias to lay the foundation of Zion to prepare the way as one mighty and strong. Now Jesus said he would send one mighty and strong to set the house of God in order. Joseph Smith taught that God the witness or the Holy Ghost had to take a body to come to do the same or similar things that Jesus Christ had done. He is the evening star and he is mighty and strong. And there are three others who are mighty and strong who will assist in the work with the remnant who redeemed Zion in the wilderness. Anyway, but um, the only reason I understand that is because in 2013, uh, God came to me and he said, Kneel down before me and ask me who you are. And I asked the Father who I was, and then he showed me who I am as the witness of the Father and the Son. And he showed me um, visually in a... Uh, I, it was an out-of-body experience. He took my spirit out of my body and took me into a vision of the past where I was there and I was watching this happen. And I saw the Father, the Son, and the Witness standing in front of their place of authority, in front of their thrones. And there were 12 who were standing in front of the Father and the Son. And the Father told me, these are they who are mighty and strong. And I was among those who were the mighty and strong ones. And I saw Lucifer before he fell. And he was the witness. He was an actual God. And when he fell... His position of authority was taken from him. His name of uh, Lucifer or Hillel ben Shakar, the bearer of light and truth, was stripped from him and he became Hasatan or Satan. Shatan, the accuser. And I was chosen from among the quorum of mighty, the ones who are mighty and strong to take the place of the witness. That's why I've seen the Father and the Son face to face and embraced them both in the flesh. And that there are three more to come who will assist in the work like Peter, James, and John. But Joseph Smith was an Elias and he was one who was mighty and strong. In Doctrine and Covenants section 85, everybody gets hung up on the one mighty and strong, but the word the doesn't exist in the scriptures. Jesus simply said he would send one mighty and strong, not the one mighty and strong, and a lot of people just don't understand. And they, they, they add things uh, to try to make it make sense according to their limited understanding, and a lot of people will believe... Sorry, my alarm clock just went off. Anyway, they believe that, um, that Joseph Smith is the one who was prophesied to come. And uh, he wasn't. He was not the one prophesied to come in that scripture. But he is one who is mighty and strong. Anyway, continuing on. Uh, but John the Baptist was also mighty and strong, and so was Elijah. All right. 
When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 14. Uh, which is interesting because it shows that they believe in multiple mortal probations, um, which doctrine is still understood in the deeper teachings of uh, Jewish uh, teachings in the Kabbalah and in other places. Um, but I really like that scripture because um, this isn't in the text that I'm reading today, but... Um, it says in the scripture, then Peter said, uh, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and Yeshua, Jesus, he said, flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my father in heaven. So he received it by revelation. The fact that Jesus Christ is the very son of God. He said, Flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father in heaven. And upon this rock will I build my church. The rock that he was building upon is the rock of revelation. And as Moses taught, God would that all his children were prophets. He wants us all to receive revelation from him. Not to have to trust in the flesh of men to, to make a, a man or a woman an idol in front of him. And that includes the, the scriptures. That we cannot understand the scriptures without receiving revelation from God. We can hear the teachings of others who, who proclaim to understand it. But ultimately... We must do as James chapter 1 verse 5 suggests. If you lack wisdom, ask God and he will give it to you freely. And he will not punish you for asking. That's a more literal translation than the KJV. God wants us to ask him questions. And as we study things out and we ask sincere questions, he will give us the answers. Sometimes it's by direct revelation. Sometimes we'll hear his voice. Sometimes it's impressions upon the mind. Sometimes it's visions. Sometimes he will send angels to us and we will see the servants of God face to face. But we must always ask for a confirmation of the Spirit to make sure that we are understanding it correctly because we can interpret things. Even though God speaks to, to us directly, even in the scriptures or even with us face to face, sometimes it takes us a, a processing time to understand what he's saying. And in that processing time, Sometimes we get things wrong. So we have to take things to him line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, so that we will make sure that our interpretation of the things that we have been told is, is in line with what the Father has for us. And that we have the ability to do that as the children of God. God said he's no respecter of persons. He wants us to know him. Joseph Smith said that all the blessings and all the visions and all the revelations and everything that he's experienced, that we too can experience those things. And I believe uh, for the most part he's right. I wouldn't expect to... Actually, I don't know if if there was any place where he would be wrong about that. Anyway, continuing on, this is a pretty short chapter, but um, last 
the last two time uh, times that I've been off have been very busy, and I haven't been able to uh, to get a podcast or a video out. So I thought I would do one while I'm in my semi truck here in, in uh, the Chain Up area in Indian Pass on Highway 191, 23 miles south of Duchesne, Utah. And I have just uh, probably about 30 minutes left before I am able to drive, but I thought I would put this out there. But anyway, so um, Truman Manson, who was a scholar and a gentleman, I really enjoyed his work, and I really enjoyed uh, meeting with him and talking with him. A Jewish apocalyptic tradition says that those two prophets... Who are the one that test the ones who testify in the streets of Jerusalem to prepare the hearts of the Jews to be turned to the prophets? See Doctrine and Covenants section 98 verses 16 and 17, and are then to literally be killed and lie in the streets, martyrs just before the coming of the Messiah are Elijah and Enoch, and that's speculation. Lots of people have speculated about who the two prophets are. Um, the two prophets are listed in Revelations chapter 11, and they are the witnesses of the Father and the Son. And God the witness is one of them. So, anyway, uh, that's Truman G. Manson's and his book, uh, The Radiant Life, page 108. So, um, I guess I could talk a little bit about Revelations chapter 11. So, these two prophets that are in the place that is called Jerusalem, where the Holy of Holies is today, not in a temple that will be built in the future, but is actually there, metaphorically is Jerusalem that these two prophets will teach among the people and they will be rejected by their people. And they uh, will te uh, testify and declare for many years that they are the witnesses, that they are witnesses of God. And the people will reject them. They will call them lunatics and liars and, and deceivers and all the kinds of things that they they can do um, because Satan will put it in their heart to reject them. And the sad thing about this scripture is that when they're put to death, everybody celebrates. I think that this is my speculation, I don't know, but I think that they will be uh, one of the reasons why uh, the church fails. Just because of, of knowledge and people listening to them. And, and the people will hear them, but they won't accept them. But they will say, well, yeah, these these things aren't right, so we can't trust the church, but but this guy's crazy and we can't trust him either, and these two guys are crazy, whatever. Now, the ministry hasn't started yet for that, but when they're put to death, um, there will be no doubt that they're dead. They will be put to death in the street for the whole world to see. And on the third day, God will put them back together and they will be resurrected in front of everyone to see. And this is the sad part. It says great fear fell upon the, them, those people who are watching, those people who are celebrating their death. And the reason why great fear falls upon them is because these two witnesses who have been teaching and testifying and witnessing that they are exactly who they claim to be. And people did not accept them. 
that they not only rejected them, but they slandered them, that they tore them apart. Uh, they tore their reputations apart. They, they tried to destroy them in every way that they could. And finally, they did it physically. But they didn't do it spiritually. And they celebrate because... Because they're finally dead. But great fear falls upon them because they realize that, that they were actually who they claimed to be. And the two witnesses will be caught up unto heaven before their very eyes. And I believe at this point, all they who accepted the two witnesses will be taken up as well. They'll be translated. They'll be... Uh, raptured and that's another reason why great fear falls upon them because these people have been warned time and time again that this is going to happen and they wouldn't listen And they know destruction is about to come, and it comes with full force. And these people are past repentance, and there's nothing they can do to change the consequences of their actions. Because the two witnesses are the same as... Moroni talking to Joseph Smith, I think it was in 1823, he says that uh, cha Isaiah chapter 11 was about to happen and that the man of Acts chapter 3 verses uh, 22 and 23 is Christ or is Messiah or a Messiah. But the day had not yet come when he would be rejected by his people. Now, Jesus Christ, Messiah ben Judah, was rejected by his people, the Jews, at that point. But Mashiach ben Yosef, Messiah ben Joseph, had not yet been rejected by his people. But he would be. Joseph Smith wasn't rejected by the majority of his people. Joseph Smith was not Messiah ben Joseph. And the man of Acts chapter two, uh, chapter 3, 22 and 23, it says, All they who will not hear this prophet, the man like unto Moses, all they who will not hear the words of this prophet, prophet will be destroyed from among the people. And that scripture directly applies to those who will not hear the witness when he comes in the flesh or the two witnesses when their ministry comes into flourishing, where they are gathering the remnant. And they are screaming from the streets, telling people to repent and turn back to the first works of the restoration. And I'm not talking about the works of, uh, of Brigham Young or uh, Heber C. Kimball or John Taylor. I'm talking about the gospel is restored by the prophet Joseph Smith. There's too many things in the church today that we don't do that are part of the scriptures. It is not given for one man to own that which is above another, wherefore the whole world lieth in sin. And if you will be a Zion people, which is the goal of the restoration, if you will be a Zion people, you must be equal in all things. The leadership of the church should be setting the example, but they don't. But the membership doesn't either. Is it any wonder that Jesus said that the house of God would have to be set back in order? There's too many things that we just, uh, we say, oh, that's not for us. We don't need to worry about that. 
but God wants us to do as he has commanded. And if we're not going to do it, then he will set the house of God in order, but he will not include the churches. Because the one man who is likened to Moses is the one that you have to come to to get your con confirmations and your baptisms and all of your ordinances from. In Daniel chapter 12, it talks about in the last days that, that a man clothed in linen would stand with his hands in the air, so both of his arms to the square after the manner of the Melchizedek priesthood, and he would sever the power of all the holy people. The power is the priesthood, and the holy people are those of the restoration. I asked God why he wanted me to do this, because he told me to do it before I even knew that scripture existed. And he said, because if they will not accept you as my witness, I will not accept them. So the gate that you have to come through is baptism and uh, conferrals and ordination through my hands. And I know everybody says, Jesus is the keeper of the gate. And they take it out of context because Joseph Smith was the keeper of the gate. People had to go to him to get priesthood. The gate that is being talked about that is the gate of heaven. It's not Peter that stands at the pearly gates. Jesus does that work himself. But without Peter, James, and John spreading the gospel and baptizing people, without Joseph Smith baptizing people and, and uh, conferring people with the priesthood and, and all the things that he did, people would not be able to get to that gate to begin with. And when I saw the Father and the Son face to face in 2003, he gave me all of the keys and the authority with the fullness of the priesthood. And I got my calling and election made sure I was sealed up unto the Father. That I might be sealed up unto eternal life. So I don't have to worry about whether I'm going to make it because I have a sure foundation that I know that, that uh, the Father laid his physical hands upon my physical head and he sealed me up into himself and that uh, I was given the fullness of, of the priesthood and the keys, all of the keys to set the house of God in order. So I, I am a keeper at a gate, not the gate. Anyway, um, I hope that you found this uh, podcast and this uh, YouTube video beneficial. I hope that you'll consider the words that I have shared. When we come back, back on next time, I'm going to be reading chapter 19 of the teachings of the doctrine of eternal lives. And the title of the chapter is Elias, Elijah, Noah, and John the Baptist. So anyway, I'm... Um, I've got about 20 minutes before I can get moving down the road, so I'm going to uh, wrap this video up and, and get some uh, things done. I'm going to eat some food and, and uh, make sure everything is right before I uh, head on out of here. So thank you. Thank you for watching. Take care, everyone. God bless. And goodbye.